Members, could you take your seats, please? It's just coming up to half past. Good evening and welcome to this Policy and Resources Committee meeting for the 30th of October. Before we start on the agenda, may I take this opportunity to advise you that if the fire alarm does sound, please remain seated to enable Mrs. Matthews to assess the situation and give further instructions on the evacuation of the building if necessary. Tonight's proceedings will be a little different regarding the webcast. I think you've all been notified that we have no Wi-Fi. We are trying to do a test tonight to establish if we have got the problem resolved, so if you're aware of that. Uh, but if anyone else is intending to record these proceedings, can you please let me know now? I can't see anybody indicating. I ask this question not to stop you, but merely to ensure that members and other members of the public in the room know that this is taking place. As far as I can see, we have no members of the public tonight. So, Mrs. Matthews, do we have apologies for absence, please? We do. Councillors Bryce, Fermer, Garland, Harper and Perry. Thank you. And notification of substitute members. Right, let's start with that side of the room, please. Right, I'm substituting for Councillor Harper. <coughs> Councillor Round. I'm currently substituting for Councillor Blackmore on the <coughs> supposition that she may be late. However, having said that, I'm aware she's unable to get to other meetings, so I'm prepared to stay if she's not. All right, thank you. Councillor Burton for Councillor Garland. <coughs> Councillor Garden for Councillor Bryce. Okay. Councillor Butler for Councillor Perry. Councillor English for Councillor Firmer. Sorry, Members, can I just ask that you actually do have all the substitutes, that you do have a full set of papers, because there are yellow pages tonight. Do you all have them? No. Okay, we'll, we'll see if we can sort that out later on then. Thank you. As far as I'm aware, we have no urgent items tonight. Visiting members, Councillor Round, were you going to come as a visiting member anyway? Councillor Round, or just in, on the off chance that we needed a substitute? I will stay as a visiting member if Councillor Blackmore attends. And any particular item you wish to speak on? Nothing specific. Thank you. Disclosures by members and officers. Is anybody disclosing? No, none tonight. Any disclosures of lobbying? Yes, Councillor Burton. I have been lobbied on matters contained in the, uh, oh, sorry, confusing meetings tomorrow night. Sorry, apologies. Yes. <laughs> it happens to us all, Councillor Burton. <laughs> and to consider whether any items should be taken in private because of the possible disclosure of exempt information, we do have a part two item on the agenda. I propose that we take this item in private due to the possible disclosure of exempt information. Is this agreed, members? Thank you very much. And if you just wait a moment, if we turn to the minutes of the meeting held on the 20th of September, you'll find those pages one to seven. I'll go through them for accuracy, please. Page one, page two, page three, page four, page 5, page 6, and page 7. Can I take this that this is accurate? And happy for me to sign the members? Thank you. Right. Yes. On, on these papers, like many other committee papers, we have issues that come up which are sort of action points. And because we <coughs> don't really have matters arising or any, in, in local government, sometimes they can sort of fall through the floor and, uh, or we don't necessarily get a progress report, although usually we do. Um, I just wonder whether when we're looking at the forward plan, whether there is a way of dealing with this. 
thank you for raising this. In actual fact, it's something I have discussed with the Chief Exec and with Sam Bailey. We are looking to see whether there's a way of having another section put under the forward plan so that any committee that has items that, um, you know, where we've made a recommendation that means a referral to another committee or, or an issue that we need to know whether it's happened, whether there's a way of actually having a look at that so that we, we don't have to just remember it in our memories, if I can put it that way, but we can actually um, ha um, see it through to a logical conclusion. For instance, just to give you an example, at our last meeting, we did have two referrals to two different committees. As yet, they have not appeared on those papers. And so clearly, we'd need to know that that's picked up and it is forwarded. And Chief Exec, did you want to add anything to that? And just to um, exemplify a little, so certainly for our partnership meetings, we have an action log and we simply uh, put the date where we expect to take the action that's been identified. And those are things that are, for this committee, would be things in addition to the recommendations in, in any particular report. So we're happy to introduce that as a means of monitoring and for you to be sure that we're following up on the conclusions and decisions that you've made. Thank you very much. Members, I hope you're happy with that. Councillor McLaughlin, you did indicate. Thank, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I was still on page five of the minutes when you were on page seven. Um, I did have a question on page six, if I may, um, relating to the, the exclusion of Seven Oaks and Dover from the, um, from the business rates pool. I remember the question being asked that, um, that would that mean the pool wouldn't go ahead? And my understanding of the answer was that it would still go ahead with or without Dover, where there are specific um, matters to, of concern. Uh, I can't remember what the answer was on Seven Oaks, and it, it would have been useful to have had that minuted. Can, uh, can Mr. Somebody... Green, would you like to come in, please? Yeah, thanks, uh, Councillor McLaughlin. The position is that uh, a business rates retention pilot application has gone in for all of the Kent authorities, including Medway, Seven Oaks, and Dover. Uh, but the application states that if it's unsuccessful and we therefore have to revert to the existing pooling arrangements, then the pool would exclude Seven Oaks and Dover. So if the application is successful, Seven Oaks and Dover will be in. If it's unsuccessful, they're excluded. Councillor McLaughlin, are you happy with consent? Thank you. I don't think we have any petitions, Mr. Matthew. And no questions from members of the public tonight. So um, we'll go to Mr. Green, please, for the committee work programme, which you'll find on page eight. Thank you, Madam Chair. There are just a couple of things that I'd like to uh, draw members' attention to uh, where I can provide updates. Uh, first of all, you'll see that there's an item called property strategy coming to the committee in December. Uh, this will actually be fo focusing on uh, commercial investments and uh, it will be uh, with Lucy Stroud as report author uh, and uh, me as the lead. And the other one to update you on is right at the bottom uh, by this reference to the Moat Park Lake Dam, we have now uh, instructed engineers who will be advising on the options and we expect to be able to report back to the committee uh, on that in January this uh, next year, January 18. Councillor McLaughlin. Um, I, I don't know if this is pertinent, but with regard to the office accommodation strategy. I gather there was a meeting held on this um, and I don't recall being invited to it, whereas in the past I had been. Uh, and I wonder whether our group is actually represented on that uh, committee anymore. Uh, yes, uh, we understood that Councillor Blackmore was your uh, group's representative and she was invited. 
Uh, I've subsequently spoken to Councillor Perry, uh, and uh, he, he will be uh, letting us know who your group's representative will be for future meetings. So your group will be uh, consulted as we go forward, and, and there's another meeting as a working group planned for next month. This is like being fired by proxy. <laughs> Mrs. Blackmore was subbing for me when she attended, so um, I'll wait to see what my leader says. Thank you for that. Members, if there are no more questions on that item, interesting, but... <laughs> Uh, we'll go to the corporate risk update and risk appetite statement on pages 9 to 28. Just to make things go, I hope, smoothly, this report will be split into two, with the recommendations also being taken separately. The first part on the risk management framework will be presented by Mr. Heppleston, and the second part on the risk update will be presented by Mrs. Blake. So if you'd like to lead us in, Mr. Heppleston, please. Many thanks and good evening, members. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to talk you through another risk update. Um, over the course of the last 18 months to two years, we have been providing you with risk. I'm not sure. Can, can you actually, it's me, I haven't turned mine on. Do I need to be close? Is that okay? Uh, can you hear me okay? Uh, it's my booming voice. Um, <laughs> over the last 18 months to two years, we have been providing the committee um, with risk updates, both in terms of the substance of our corporate risk register and also with progress reports on how we've been implementing the new risk management framework. Um, this report, which speaks um, about the risk appetite, um, essentially is the final stages to the implementation of the risk management framework. As an authority, we recognize that we need to take risks in order to achieve our ambitions. And what the risk appetite seeks to do is articulate how we will take those risks and also guide those that are making decisions, risk owners, and also provide assurance to members of the public that we are managing risks appropriately. Our risk appetite statement seeks to achieve a balance between a cautious approach, but also to one of innovation. We will not seek to take unnecessary risks that carry significant negative consequences without seeking to manage the impact of the risk. The risk appetite is something that needs to be set collectively, and so this report sets out some of the background behind the formulation of the risk appetite, along with the consultation we have undertaken with members, which included last month's members' briefing prior to the Policy and Resources Committee. The statement itself is included on page 17, and apologies that um, it came out in black and white, so I've, I've got a copy I can put up here behind me. The statement includes a risk matrix which sets out the outer limits of our risk appetite, which is the red line that you can see, along with the risk tolerance, which is the top right-hand corner, which is the five by five, so the catastrophic risk impact. What this is saying that as a council, we will not tolerate risks that hit that top right-hand corner, whereas we may well need to seek risks that sit within the red area in order to take the opportunities, opportunities that we need in order to achieve our ambitions. If we do, however, take a risk that's within that red area, we would seek to mitigate and manage those risks down to an acceptable level. If we are unable to manage those down to an acceptable level, that, we'd have, that we have the right monitoring and mechanisms in place. The consideration of risk um, is only one element to how we deliver services. And so ultimate, ultimately, this risk appetite and the guidance that we have in place is about strengthening the decisions that we make to ensure that we are aware of all the options, in particular, any decisions we might take that have negative consequences. In response to some of the questions previously already received by members, um, I've included within the report on page 18 some additional guidance that we provide to risk owners. This sets out the context behind the scoring of risks, but also some of the expectations and responsibilities we have for those people who are responsible for coordinating and responding to those risks. The risk matrix includes a link to our business continuity plans, which will also link to our emergency response. 
And also, while I recognise that members are not directly cited within the risk appetite statement, they will continue to be informed about key risks and the decisions that we are taking that have risk consequences. This includes mechanisms to identify risks as they arise and also to communicate those, whether that's as part of a specific risk update to members or something that happens as part of our regular discussions with members. In addition to this, we've expanded the risk management section in the report template, which will help to identify those associated risks that we may take with the decisions that members will see. The recommendation that I'm asking is that the risk appetite statement is agreed and that it's adopted into the risk management framework. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much. Councillor Harwood, you indicated. Thank you, Chairman. I mean, just an observation, really. You'll remember there was some discussion around this item at the last um, meeting where it was discussed. And I think this is a big step forward, actually, in, in terms of both methodology and in terms of presentation. Um, some of the more esoteric um, risks are, are the exclusions and, and some of the clear emissions are now included. So I, I am quite happy with it. In terms of process, um, I, I really couldn't fault the document having read through it. And I don't think there's anything for us to add or subtract. So therefore, I was certainly very happy to move that we did agree and adopt the risk management framework as, as set out in the um, recommendation. Can I ask, is that seconded? Uh, excuse me, uh, Councillor McLaughlin, you, you were first. Were you proposing to second that? I'm happy to second it, but I, I do have a, a point. And you are first. next. Thank you. Was that an invitation to speak? Sorry. Um, I, I, too, find this a very... Um, easy to follow method of presenting uh, the predominant risks that, that we face. Um, and I see now that um, they are split into six levels, I believe, um, covering the, on page 19, the headings on the risk impact. Um, it's a bit of a rhetorical question, really, but I, I wonder which headings were not included there. Um, and perhaps you can just think about that while I, while, I, while I talk on. I also wonder why we're limited to, to, to the top nine risks, and I'd just like to understand uh, the logic behind that. And then finally, just for clarification, on para 1.3, you'd expect this as chair of the audit committee, on 1.3, sorry, on page 10, um, the last sentence, this sets out under tolerance, sets out the level of risk that the council is not willing to accept, which is perfectly clear um, and well understood, until you turn to, bear with me, page 15, where in the middle of the page it says risk tolerance is the amount of risk that the council is willing to tolerate. So I think there's a knot missing there and it would be a be useful to include it as it is our appetite statement. So one, one nil to me, but um, perhaps you'd just respond to the other two, uh, Russ, if you can. Uh, of course, thanks very much for your uh, comments. Um, with regards to the impact levels, um, we tried to, to at least replicate good and recognised practice as, as terms of, in terms of understanding the wider impact of risks. Um, and actually, in terms of the definitions that we have, we've actually expanded them from elsewhere that we've seen. Um, I don't believe there's any we've necessarily excluded, if anything, we consider more, particularly in terms of environment um, and health and safety to mean some of the wider social impacts. Um, so as far as I'm aware, there's none that I, I would want to add in at the moment. Um, I will amend the tolerance to say not. Um, and the other question was about the top nine risks, was it? Why we're we restricted to nine, or, or are we not restricted and we can have more if they arise? 
Uh, we're not restricted at all. Um, really, what we were trying to distill was the, the, the key issues. We, we could come to you with lots more risk information because we have operational level risks as well as these corporate issues. Um, but it was felt with, that these were the most prominent and also the ones that spoke most directly to our um, corporate plan. But we don't know what we don't know. Your observation of we don't know what we don't know, um, but I do think that there's a, a bit in the middle, and that is the operational risks that are the responsibility, if you want to drill into more depth, um, they are considered by the service committees. And in putting together the corporate level risks, we reviewed all the operational risks, and where we had repeated issues coming forward, we considered whether or not to escalate those up to, a, to define them as a corporate risk. Um, so today probably isn't a good time to go through all that level of detail with you, but if as the Chair of Audit and Governance and Standards you would like to have to go through that in, in a lot more detail, then we'd be more than happy to, to, to do that. Councillor McLaughlin, are you content? I'm happy with the response. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Atkinson, you were next. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, on page 18, I'm not sure if this is a similar question to Councillor McLaughlin's, but um, numbers 11, 17, 18 and 19 are missing. So we've got on the left-hand column there, 20 to 25, 12 to 16. Well, is that an, and just another level which has been left out? Or have I just misunderstood what this is all about? Um, we calculate the overall score based on impact and likelihood. So it would be, for instance, we couldn't get to a score of 11 by times in the five by any of the five. So what it reflects is the score based on the, the overall. So for instance, three times four is 12, which gives you a red. There's no combination of the score that would give you a, an 11 or a 7. Councillor English, you're next. Um, just want to check, uh, Madam Chairman, because the introduction said that we were going to deal with this report in two parts. Um, but I'm not sure whether both recommendations have been moved or just the one. I'm taking it that it's just the one, as I said, that, that it would be in two parts. Yeah, just wanted to make sure, because um, I think one or two of my colleagues had an ob observations on the second part. I just wanted to make sure we hadn't missed the opportunity. Um, can I just ask again, because um, we need to organize some additional papers. So who hasn't got the yellow pages for tonight now? Two, two people are two people are indicating. Councillor Burton, you were next. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it's always difficult when one comes to a committee that you don't normally sit upon because some of the things may already have been discussed. But I think the officer touched on it, um, and I'm sort of looking in the context of page 18, where when the risks reach the highest level, we have the assurance of undertaking that um, CLT will actively monitor the risks. And I think the officer began to say something about, but uh, what's the trigger point when members would be more urgently informed of those risks other than just relying upon a more normal committee cycle? Um, so I'm just wondering whether there should be something that it, explicitly states that at some level of member engagement would take place. Um, thank you. Um, we do currently have mechanisms in place to identify key risks as and when they arise. 
um, as part of the regular consultation and communication that we have with CLT and risk owners. Risk owners are tasked to identify any emerging issues. If there was something that needed urgent attention, then the mechanism would be that would be communicated up through the senior leadership team to then take forward however may they best see fit. So, um, first of all, I think you asked for reassurance that the corporate leadership team would do the monitoring and be alive to a change in risk level, particularly those that would take us into the red or black cat categories. Um, we do that in a number of ways. We, we receive performance uh, information uh, at both the corporate leadership team and our major projects board, which we hold quarterly. And for those risks that are in those higher categories, um, depending on what the issue is, but I'll use homelessness as an example, uh, we require there to be much more frequent monitoring information brought to us. Um, in practice, the two ways in which um, we can accelerate, if we need to, bringing things to members' attention in a, in a formal setting, uh, firstly, we can use the urgency committee. It's very rare, but that has been done. And secondly, um, there have been occasions when it's been necessary to brief this committee, for example, on an emerging issue. And i just give an example of that as when the Grenfell fire t um, happened, then we provided a briefing um, very quickly in writing and then secondly to this committee um, at the first opportunity. If you would like that to be um, codified uh, in terms of our policy and practice, then I don't think there'd be any, you know, we could do that in a quite straightforward way. Councillor Burton. I, I mean, quite simply, yes, I, I would like that to be written so that we can, as members, can recognise um, how that process would play out. Members, I'm getting nods around the table, so could I just have a show of hands generally? That if you'd... I don't think we need to make that a recommendation. I think we can just incorporate that, members, and make sure that that happens. If you'll take that on board, please. Okay. Members, before I go to the vote, um, Councillor Blackmore, I do have to ask you whether you have been lobbied at all. Have you been lobbied at all on any item tonight? Uh, no, I haven't, Madam Chairman. And I do not have anything to disclose either. Thank you very much. In that case, we'll move to the first recommendation, as nobody else is indicating they wish to speak. Um, you'll find that on page nine. It's been moved by Councillor English, seconded by Councillor McLaughlin, that the risk appetite statement as set out in Appendix 1 is agreed and adopted in... Sorry? Sorry, Councillor, I thought you had... You're trying to confuse me by saying, was it part one or two? Councillor Harwood moved it, Councillor McLaughlin seconded it. Um, is that agreed? And may I have a show of hands, please? That's one down. And anybody against? Est abstention? Um, Madam Chairman, I'm just not voting because I didn't listen to all of the item. So I'm not for, against, or otherwise, but um, I don't want you to think that uh, there was anything suspicious. Okay, thank you very much. So we move on to part two, which is going to be introduced by Mrs. Blake. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, so as members know, we report the corporate risk to you on a six-monthly basis, and this report is part of that reporting cycle. Um, corporate risks are ultimately the risk that could hinder the Council from achieving its strategic objectives, and this report summarises the Council's corporate risks and how these risks have been determined. Um, the first page in Appendix 2 details how these corporate risks have been identified and also how the nine risks, the nine corporate risks, map on the risk matrix based on their inherent score, which is to say the score before any further action is taken to mitigate that risk. Um, the risks were determined through risk workshops held with officers and members and the identification of operational risks across the Council. 
and all of this information was reviewed and from this risk themes were identified and discussed with officers in order to distill and, and define the council's corporate risks. Um, the, the next page, so the second page of the appendix, provides you with details as to what has changed since the corporate risks were last reported to you. Um, and we've summarized those risks which are no longer a threat to the council achieving its objectives um, and why, and which risks have now emerged that are different. Um, the table on page 23 of the report, um, starting on page 23 of the report, um, detail, provides you with detail as to what has changed since the corporate, um, sorry, uh, where am I? Uh, so yes, sorry, the, the, the table um, outlines the, the risk description, the controls in place, and based on those controls, the risk to the council at this point in time, which is the inherent risk that I referred to earlier. And the table also details what controls the, the, the council plans to introduce or has just started to introduce and how this affects the risk, which is what we call the mitigated risk. Um, and this is particularly important where the risk is either red or black, as we've alluded to talking about the risk appetite statement. Um, apologies that the table um, formatting is, is slightly skewiff in terms of the headings. Um, and there's also the um, last two risks in the table. The mitigated risk should be um, red, not amber, um, which means that the, the, the last section that talks about um, the risks where planned actions would still result in the, the risk being quite high should actually have six risks listed, not four. Um, obviously, those risks which score highly will be monitored monthly and escalated to CLT both so that the risk can be monitored and so that support can be provided um, as needed to manage those risks. Um, the final appendices to the, the appendix um, summarize basically the risk management process and the um, impact and likelihood, um, how the impact and likelihood is scored. I'm happy to take any questions. Members, I have no, but, oh, right. Councillor Harvey. On page 22, it mentions that devolution has been removed um, and it's been superseded by a wider risk relating to partnership engagement. Under partnership engagement, it doesn't reference devolution at all. And whilst I accept that devolution has perhaps gone on the back burner for a bit, I still think it is a very prevalent risk and perhaps it should be prudent for us to add it back in either as its own item or clearly stated within that risk. Is that possible? Would you like to respond immediately? Um, it's certainly something that we can, I'd say, raise with the risk owner, but as Alison is the risk owner, then it's something we can certainly uh, talk about and reflect in the, in the register, if you wish. Can you repeat again? Um, I think what Mr. Heppleston was saying was, that as I'm the risk owner, then maybe I'd like to ask, answer the question. Um, I think this is a good illustration of how the... Um, the extent of risk, the likelihood and the, and the impact can change over, over time and why it's important for us to keep under review what the corporate risks are. So in my opinion, um, the, the need to consider and the appetite for consideration of devolution has significantly diminished. Um, but what has increased in prominence is the, um, the opportunity to consider becoming uh, more involved in other, other partnerships. Hence, for the time being, connecting the two, two things together. If things were to change, for example, if there was a change in either government prior, policy or priority for devolution, then we'd need to think again. Does that answer your question? Councillor English. I think it's true that the, that the issue has receded to some extent. I think some, it can be overestimated as to how far it's gone away. Um, I don't want to get into what people might be thinking at certain other buildings in, this, in a close proximity to, to this town hall, but um, it, is, it is receded but not completely gone. So, so I think... It would be fair, I think that Councillor Harvey's right to say that there should be some 
consideration of it, but I would agree that it, it has receded to, to a significant degree. It's a question of what degree of weighting to put on it, I think, isn't it? Um, so I think perhaps would say significantly reduced or par partially reduced, uh, whichever preference you use. I think your, your word in Madam Chief Executive is probably the right one, significantly reduced, but not completely gone away. And so if we could sort of reword it to take account of, of that weighting. Chief Exec. So, so I'd invite you then to think about if you want something changed, then the most appropriate part of the list of corporate risks would be um, the one that relates to partner relationships. Um, we could certainly add to that a continued horizon scanning with respect to devolution, if that would allay your fears. Yes. Okay. Members, can we take that as an addition? Are you in agreement? I will come to you, Councillor Burton. I, I have got you. It's, it's, I think it would, all right, from the chair, because of the conversations and the meetings I go to, I personally think it would be unwise to lose it completely. I think it would be wise to have a, a very minor uh, amount in there, just so we keep it on the horizon, but not as a, a major risk at the moment, as the Chief Exec has said. If you want to think about it for a moment, I'll call Councillor Burton. I, I think half of what I was going to ask was covered by that point, because when we're talking about replacing the devolution risk with a view on partnership working, my question specifically was, is that risk that's identified on the bottom of page 24 that same risk? Or was that risk under another guise now doubling up for that substitution? Because I think there are two elements to that, aren't there? You know, there's some very specific mentions to... Um, the other local authority and risk around that, which is somewhat different to bringing that in as a substitute for looking at the horizon of devolution and close working. So are we going to use the same risk assessment for both elements? That's kind of what I was trying to draw out there. Um, and then I'll try and get this off my chest as quickly as possible, because I always have this issue when we look at these risks. Um, that political ambition and political change is regarded as a risk. Um, you know, I believe that this organization should stand ready to service the democratic output of our electorate at any time. And its role is in being ready to do so, not considering that such a clear instruction should be a risk. And I just have a real issue with the way this is always portrayed in every risk register that we actually encounter. So really, I just would like to say that. Chief Exec, do you wish to come back on that point? Although there's another small point I'll add in a moment, if I may. Firstly, on devolution and partnership working, um, this is my um, initial reaction. If we were to, con uh, well, firstly, um, partnership working has regularly been in our risk register for at a corporate level. If we were to make a reference to devolution within that, my initial advice to you would be, I don't think it changes the likelihood or the impact of the considerations that we've already given to partnership working. Um, but as we go through the regular review, then I'm more than happy to think about that again. Um, with respect to change in the political environment, by the inclusion of that isn't in any way meant as, as a criticism of the fact that that may occur. It's simply a recognition that when that does occur, it can have an impact on how we are delivering services. As Councillor Burton suggests, that can be for good reasons. Um, but the impact sometimes is to slow things down, to require a realignment of spending and a whole range of other things 
and that then by its nature puts at risk what has already been decided while new ways of doing things or new priorities are agreed and that's the intention behind behind that the inclusion of that in our um, risk descriptions councillor burton do you want to come back uh, well I'll, I'll leave that particular issue where it's, it, it is but I raise it every time um, the other one that I wanted to just highlight and it, it's kind of similar um, and I think the added to section increased housing pressures um, that we're <coughs> adding that as a risk um, it, it's another one of the risk is a fait accompli there's either more housing or there's not and the risk is to do with our readiness to cope with it not the intrinsic occurrence itself if that makes the slightest bit of sense to anyone what I'm trying to convey um, it sounds to me a rather fine point and I think the most important thing is that we recognize that even though it may, may be inherent that it exists and for us, and I don't think this is the case for every local authority, it is a particularly acute um, risk. So whether we, however we come to that conclusion, I think that merits us having a very overt and clear inclusion of that topic within our risk register. Do you wish to come back before I go to Councillor Borden? No, I'm content that the Chief Executive said I made a fine point. Councillor Borden. Yeah, thank, thank you, Ms., uh, Madam Chairman. I do echo what Councillor Burton says about devolution. And personally, I have no problem with it being removed from uh, the risk register, really, um, uh, for, for the point that's made. The one thing that just reading through this caught me was um, sort of, um, again, it's quite a detail point but on the IT systems failure and security as more and more this council has to use sort of relies on IT and just to give you by way of example some of you may know I, I have a parliamentary email account and there was a massive cyber attack in June which took the whole network down for a week and in effect the whole place ground to a halt for a week at least and a, a month now, if that happened to this council I would argue that the impact on that was warranted on this risk register um, getting a monthly report to the corporate leadership team rather than sort of being its current, um, its current sort of um, box as two falls really. So I just thought I'd flag that up Madam Chairman to be honest because it's one of those things that hopefully it will never happen but as we're here identifying risk and the, uh, the impact of it. Um, I'd argue that will have a bigger impact in the a very short and immediate term than almost anything else to this council and perhaps would warrant sort of, um, sort of going right at the top of our, of our formula. Do you want to come back on that one? Because I know there's been a lot of discussion over this point. Um, yeah, I, I think by way of how it would work practically, um, we keep the corporate risks certainly on the agenda and particularly those red and highest level risks will form part of the regular monitoring through CLT and also through the wider leadership team which is the heads of service um, and so particularly any kind of spikes in impact or likelihood or changes to those particular risks would be flagged up um, but we would be presenting at least these corporate risks to CLT on a regular basis anyway. So certainly with those red risks, it's something that we could communicate more regularly. Councillor Borden, do you want to wish to come back? No, I just, I, 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 appreciate, I appreciate what's been said, but um, I just, and I say this from personal experience at work more than anything, to be honest, that, you don't expect it to hit, but when it does hit, it causes a minor catastrophe, really. And I think we've got to be, we've got to be prepared for it. And it's one of those things that I don't think we should sort of overestimate its impact and we should prepare for all eventualities because, hey, 10, 15 years ago, it wouldn't have been as much of a disaster as it is now, just the reliance that everyone has on their IT systems. Uh, so can I ask then, 
are you proposing that we should change either the score for likelihood or impact? And I'd just like to say in terms of preparedness, yes, you are absolutely right. Um, we were, we experienced some of the same effects that the NHS did earlier in the year. Um, having said that, we were better prepared, um, able to act immediately, and we didn't need to shut any of our major systems down. So I just wanted to say that to give some assurance about the level of preparedness, but to ask for your clarification about whether or not you want to change either of the two parameters, likelihood or impact. Well, I hope I, I would change impact to it at five, personally. Um, yeah. I'd probably leave likelihood as, at four, um, but I'd certainly change impact to five. I think that's a bit of a no-brainer, to be honest. Yeah. Members, is that a general view? And again, I, I, nodding heads isn't really any good. I need to know if it is a general... Just a moment, Councillor English, before I do... I think Councillor Bolton's point is generally correct. It, 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 the increasing reliance of the Council as we move forward to things that have been discussed elsewhere, like office accommodation and so on, only actually increases our exposure to vulnerability to cyber attack. So I think that it, we have to give due weighting to this, and I would say that the score probably does need to be increased slightly. All right, members. Can all right, Councillor McLaughlin. Um, whilst I wouldn't disagree with that, um, I would then argue uh, that the likelihood actually isn't necessarily probable, which I think is where it is at the moment. So whilst you might want to increase the impact to five, I've reduced the likelihood. I don't think we should go... I don't think we should go there, Councillor McLaughlin. I think the officers are very good at actually thinking this through. But I do think from the chair that it is a worry for all of us. So if you agree that we should change the impact to five, then, but I'd like a show of a hand. Yes, Councillor. Can I come back on this? I, I am a bit concerned that when you make these calculations, that they're empirical calculations where you're weighing up actual risk, you're looking at the business continuity plan, you're looking at the systems in place. It's not a kind of pillar, pluck a number out of the air, oh, that would be really bad. It's, it's genuinely what is the likelihood of an impact and what is, a, a, and, and it's almost inconceivable that the, unless you lost complete power and the, the, that you lose all data. So I, I think it's got about right and, and I don't think we should be changing anything on the hoof. So if there's a, a counter motion, I would like to make it that we stick with the more scientific approach which has been utilized. I actually don't think we've had anybody make a motion officially. I don't think it's actually been officially. It been. hasn't officially been moved. Um, might I make a suggestion that actually we're talking from sort of perceptions and views. Could I suggest that it might be useful if we had some information brought back to us about how this is actually being scored and what's behind it before we go off at a... Sorry? Yes, you can. So just to give you some guidance, in the report itself, we set out on page 28 the considerations for each one. And just responding to Councillor Borton's point about experience at the Houses of Parliament, where we, where we say in terms of risk of, of impact, the impact would be at level four. If you, if you look at the service delivery column there, and that's failure to deliver council priorities or poor service disrupted for a, a period of five days. So that's the judgment that we have, have made that if, you know, the, if particularly um, a far reaching impact on our IT service, then that could be the level of imp impact. It seems to me from what you said that that almost a complete reflection of the sorts of impact that, that you had in your mind, whereas a catastrophic level in terms of impact would be ongoing for a long period of time. Um, with the mitigation that we've identified, we think that the judgment is at four rather than five. 
Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Chair. I'm grateful to the Chief Executive for bringing our attention to the um, definitions on page 28. But when I look at the risk likelihoods, I see that probable, not only is it a strong possibility, but similar occurrences known often, often, in local government council history. Whereas possible says it might occur. I rest my case. Chief Exec, do you wish to say anything else? Because I do, I, there are times when I believe we do have to have some confidence in what our officers have actually said and what they're actually doing. But I do take, Councillor Borton, I know if you've experienced it, you, you're, you'll have a heightened awareness of, of the risks that are there. Um, it's, this is not the place to talk about the protection and the, the, the measures we have in place but I can assure you that if you wish to be talked through them by the head of IT, uh, you might wish to actually take advantage of that so that you can have some surety of the systems we have in place. Do you still wish to change this, or are you prepared to wait and, and think about it and maybe get some more information if you wish, Councillor Borton? I'll go away, have a discussion with the head of IT, and I'll come back to this committee if I'm not satisfied with the outcome. Thank you. I think that is a wise way forward. Councillor Garton? I was at the briefing a few weeks ago when we discussed all of this, and a lot of members there had improved su suggestions for improvements, etc. I think, could we have a workshop in 12 months from now just to see what feedback we can uh, put in, whether we can tweak the system a little bit better. And uh, as for tonight is concerned, can we just go with what is recommended by the officers? Councillor Garton, do you promise to attend if we can arrange one? I certainly will attend, yeah. We'll discuss whether we, we can actually put something in place. Right, that brings us back to the devolution. It, sorry, Councillor English, you, were you just waving your pen or, or did you yes, want to I speak? mean, I don't think we, I agree that we shouldn't change it now because, because it has been assessed, but I do have concerns about how we draw this work going forward, which is why I initially uh, said there was some sense in what Councillor Bolton was saying, because as we transform our operation, we will need, I think, to transform our approach to our risk management and our assessments. I just want to make, just really want to flag up that I'm sure it will be, but these two pieces of work need to be drawn together very, very carefully. I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but, but it's um, something that, that will, I think, increase in, 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 bond, uh, um, in importance as we change our working relationships. Um, I, I would caution again, be, be very careful about holding workshops on security issues. <laughs> it's, a, it's not necessarily the best way of doing it. It depends what the content is and what we cover. Members, I'm, I, I will say something now because I think it's going to come to a lot of us shortly and I have been very clearly advised and I'm quite happy to say this publicly that the major risks we have is not necessarily on, uh, in the way it was in the past. The major risks now come through an approach through individuals using equipment and how it then actually impacts on the system. And that is something that all of us who use iPads and different pieces of equipment are going to have to consider very carefully as we move forward and may have to accept measures that we didn't have to accept in the past. So, I, I, uh, Councillor Borton, I think you have raised a very important point, but we all have to be aware that this is a moving game and the people out there who choose to try and compromise systems are moving all the time as well. So, I am sure the officers are, are really alive to that, but we will think of a way that we can satisfy um, members' concerns, and Councillor Borton, I think you'll find it very interesting to actually uh, go and talk to the head of IT. Councillor Burton. Very briefly, so if I'm correct in my understanding, it currently would score like 16 rating, and that means that it's reviewed quarterly by CLT. 
all I would say is that in the private sector, these cyber risks are reviewed more frequently than that um, at board level currently in the current climate. And that can only be achieved in our matrix if it scores more highly where CLT would actually actively monitor. So I'm just drawing the parallel of how the private sector are actually reviewing or considering this risk assessment, but it is at the highest level of corporate management, permanently on radar, not quarterly review. I think we've said it all, Councillor Burton. We, the officers will go away, have a serious look at this. Anybody who wants to know more about it can do so um, by talking to the head of IT. If after that you still have concerns, then we will raise it again. I, I, I think we all agree, officers and ourselves uh, and councillors, that this is a very serious issue, but we don't need to have a knee-jerk reaction either. So, so let, let's, let's think on this. I think it's something I would like to come back, though, very quickly so that councillors can be reassured if you take that on board. And that brings us, yes, councillor. Sorry, Madam Chairman, can I just ask one quick question? I'm sure when this came out last year or the year before, it went to audit yes. and audit had a look at it yes. first. Yes. So, and, and I'm sorry, I, I might have missed something, but has this not been through audit again? So they've had a look at it with a slightly different critical viewpoint. Mr. Helperson. Uh, the role of audit is to get assurance over the process of risk management, not necessarily the substance of the individual risks. So what we present to um, audit committee as part of the head of audit opinion is that the council has a framework in place that will identify key risks, that will take action and put controls in place. The substance and detail of the individual risks obviously sit with risk owners and the committees. So they wouldn't have been through the specific detail of these risks. Otherwise, there's, you're having two people, two committees doing the same thing. Members, I'm going to draw this to a close. I'm, I'm formally requesting the officers to have another look at this, please. I think just to satisfy everybody, um, just in case. And as I said, I suggest, Councillor Borton, that you actually go and talk to the head of IT and, and to satisfy yourself that we are taking all measures. And we will look, to, I agree with Councillor English, we don't talk in a workshop about our particular um, measures, but I do think that people could learn a bit more about the, ge the general area that we are discussing here. So I also need to get some words about the devolution issue. The Chief Exec has suggested that, which page is it? On page 24, if you turn to that. <coughs> that under the poor partner relationships, which is at the bottom of the page, we could add continued horizon scanner, scanning read, in respect to devolution. Continued horizon scanning in respect of devolution. So members, can I ask if you are happy to have that added? Well, I'll, I'll, all right, just a mo moment. Can I, before I go to the actual um, recommendation where it will have to be put in. I just want to know if that wording is acceptable. Can I have a show of hands for those who will accept that wording? That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's eleven against one. Any abstentions? No. All right. I have had nobody actually move this, but it now becomes that the corporate risks as set out in Appendix 2 are noted with the addition of, and that's those wordings, that wording. Councillor English. 
That's formally moved by Councillor English, seconded by Councillor Harvey. May I have a show of hands for those in favour, please? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve. Do you make it twelve? Twelve. Against? Against? Abstentions? Did you? I'm so, sorry, Councillor Burton, but I didn't see you indicate. Did, did you? Thank you. Yeah. I, it, Madam Chair, I was voting in favour because we need to have this policy in place. But I would ask that you note know, my dissent on some of the aspects that we've discussed. Right, let's get the voting done and then we'll take your dissent. So can I just have it, those in favour again, please, so we're absolutely sure? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. That's 13. Against? Against? No. Abstentions? Two. Now, Councillor Burton. I was simply asking that my concerns in relation to um, the cyber threat and that it should be escalated to um, continual surveillance by CLT rather than quarterly reporting. Right, thank you. Sorry? Likewise, the Councillor Ball. As we have had a member obviously need to take a short break, I, I wasn't going to, but I'll break for 10 minutes if anybody. I need a full house here, I think, if necessary. Does anybody wish to go downstairs? 10 minutes, please. So that brings us to 22. You can stay on it as you wish, but thank you very much. <laughs> Thank 